someday, some missionary will go over those broken bottle limestone mountains. Someday, for the last time, they'll go down into a newly discovered area among a people who had never heard the message of redemption. Someday, for the last time, somebody hearing that message will bow their head and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins and come into my heart and life. And then he said, the clouds will part asunder. Jesus will be there. Every new valley I've gone down into, every new range that I've crossed over, I've thought of those words of Dr. Jeffrey. Someday, for the last time, and then the clouds will part asunder, and Jesus will be there. And I would say, Lord, is this the last valley into which we will go? I've been a missionary for 54 years. I did, not, I did not even know who the Lord really was until I was nine years old. I used to go to Sunday school. I knew something about this Jesus in the Bible. But who he was personally, I didn't know him. And I used to stay behind after everybody had left the uh, Sunday school room. And I'd say to my gray-haired teacher, why do I have no peace in my heart? I knew that there was something wrong in my life. And so she would just pat me on the head and say, Honey, just do the best you can. That's all God expects of you. But that's not what God is looking for. Our best is nothing but filthy rags before him. And we were a very poor family. We didn't really know we were poor because there was love in our home. But my mother had to go out and work because my father had double leakage of the heart and was in bed. And uh, she worked to provide for a sick husband and four children. The neighbor had a radio. And she came one day and she said, I want you to come over on Sunday morning. There is a man speaking and he has the most wonderful messages. She said, I've never heard anything like it before. So we went over the next Sunday morning, my mother and I, sat down on the floor and listened to this man. And for the first time, I understood why it was necessary for Christ to die for me. The guilty was being covered by the sacrifice of the innocent. And uh, he mentioned having been in our hometown, Boone, Iowa, for a missionary conference. And I said to my mother afterwards, I said, what's a missionary mother? She said, well, I think it's those that couldn't make it at home. And they go out to teach heathen people. And that's a lot of people's idea of missionaries. But it was very interesting to me. This man was Dr. R. R. Brown from Omaha, who had the first consecutive and the longest broadcast without ever missing a Sunday, 42 years. And uh, so we were sure we were going to go and hear this man the next Sunday again. Um, there was a problem in the tea room where my mother was working as a waitress. One of the girls said my mother had taken her tip. And my, the head who owned that tea room said, Mrs. McIntosh, why did you take her money? And my mother looked at her and she said, I never stole her money. She said, oh, you lie, Mac. We were Macintoshes, so it was Mac for all of us, eventually in our life. And my mother just took that cap off and she threw it on the counter and she said, Mrs. Richardson, I have hated a lie since I was small. And she said, I did not steal either. I didn't take her tip. And she walked out. And um, when she came home and told me that she had quit, I thought, how are we going to get food? What are we going to do now? But that afternoon, there was an advertisement in the paper that they were going to open a hosiery mill in Boone, Iowa, and that they wanted people to come and apply for the positions that were open. 
So my mother went down early the next morning and applied. She said to the man, I'll be honest with you, I don't know a thing about hose except to wear them. But she said, I know I can learn, and I have a sick husband and four children at home to provide for. And uh, miracle of miracles, that afternoon he called and said, report for work tomorrow morning, Mrs. McIntosh. My mother went in, and uh, he took her back to the table, and there sat a gray-haired lady. And uh, he said, this is Mrs. Hughes, and she'll teach you how to pull the hose down over these forms, what to look for, because we want perfection in our hosiery. And my mother, uh, she sat down while the woman instructed her, and uh, she then went back to her seat and said, Mrs. McIntosh, where do you go to church? Which was such a surprising question for her to ask. And uh, she said, I go to the Midway Tabernacle. And that rang a bell. Mother said, you mean the place where Dr. R. R. Brown has been for a missionary conference? She said, oh, yes. She said, we've had a wonderful time at the conference. And we had missionaries from Africa and India, from China, and from the Holy Land. And Mother said, uh, where is that church? She told her that was over on uh, West 5th Street. So when Mother came home, she said, darling, we're going to that church on Sunday night. And it was a blizzard blowing that night in February, but we walked four miles to that church to find God. And when we went in through these big doors at the front of the church, um, it was just with all the strength I had to get that door open. And somebody seeing from the inside that we were trying to get in, he came and pushed the door open and told us to come in. And the very friendly people, we sat down about the second row from the back. I don't remember anything about the message except that it was about Joseph down in Egypt. But before there was any invitation given, my mother was on her way to the front. And I thought, if this is the answer to the problem in my mother's life, this is what I've been looking for. And I went right after her. I knelt down at that altar, and I told the Lord how long I'd been trying to find him, and I didn't know how to find him. But I said, Lord, I need you. And I confessed my sins as a little nine-year-old girl. And that night when I rose to my feet, my Lord spoke to me the first time in a lifetime of walking with my Lord. And that's 64 years. He said, your sins are forgiven you. Go and sin no more. We went out of there. Such joy filled our hearts. And just as we went out the door, a lady said, look up Acts 16.31. When we got home, we found the Bible, and we dusted it off and looked up Acts 16, 31. It said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. And we were simple enough to believe that that meant exactly what it said. And I've learned that everything in the Word of God means exactly what it says. We prayed until every person in our family came to know the Lord Jesus Christ as personal Savior. The next year came the missionary conference, and Dr. Brown was there. And so I got to meet this man. And I, did, I would run from school in order to get there for the tail end of the afternoon services. I just absorbed everything I could from those missionaries. And the final night, when they were giving the appeal, and, of course, it was geared toward high school young people, college graduates, young couples. He said, isn't there somebody here that has a life to give for God and for those that yet sit in darkness and in the shadow of death? And this little girl sitting back there was listening to all this, and I just said in my heart, Lord, I'd go. I wish I were older. I would go for you. And I felt a hand on my shoulder, and I turned, and I looked back, and there was no one there. And I knew it was the Lord. And I looked up and I said, what is it, Lord? And he said, would you really go for me anywhere, no matter what it costs? I understand something of the cost 
now. But I don't even think about that because I've come to realize that the compensations are so tremendous when your life is given over to him and you go where he calls you to go and you are what he wants you to be. From that moment on, I realized I had a mission field. I went to tell all the neighbors that I had found Jesus. And I had once, because we were poor and these people were quite wealthy, I saw a penny on their porch and I put my foot over it. When they went inside, I picked it up and went off. I went back to them and I told them, I said, I've earned a penny and I wanted to replace the penny that I stole from you. They laughed, they thought that was very funny, anybody to be so excited and nervous about a penny. But I had to make it right with God. I had to walk before him with nothing between my soul and the Savior. I began to tell the young people in high school when I came into high school. And before I had graduated, I have personally spoken to every young person in my class about the Lord and how to find him and what he came to mean to me. And those young people used to call me Preacher Macintosh, not in a smart way, but they knew that I really loved them and I loved my Lord. And when they had problems, many of them would come to me and I would pray for them. So I, when I graduated, I immediately went into Bible college. Well, that weekend, uh, the in September, we always had our youth rallies. And these rallies took in a four different states. And we came together and I was asked to speak at the youth rally. At that rally was also a missionary from Borneo. It's now called Kalimantan. But he was telling about having been a pioneer among those people, the headhunters. And you know, in less than 10 years, God gave us more than 10,000 believers among those Dayaks, the headhunters of Borneo. And his message stirred my heart. I thought, what a wonderful thing to be able to go and tell people who have never heard that there is a God who cares for them, that sent his son to die for them, and tell them about Jesus. After I had finished speaking, I walked down off the platform and sat on the front seat. And this young man stood up and spoke. And my heart was thrilled at the message he had to give and the challenge to young people. And so uh, what I didn't know was that when I walked off the platform, God said to that man, that's the girl for you. Of course, he hadn't said anything to me, but I appreciated the man and his message. And uh, so he had followed me off. When the meeting was over, he had followed me down the aisle. And one of our ladies from the church just grabbed my arm and, and said, uh, Mr. Dibler, uh, here is a young lady we think you'd like to meet. And I turned around, and there he was. And so we shook hands, and because in college, Bible college, I had been told that uh, the students had asked me to be the vice president of the Missionary Society because you were chosen by the young people in the college with you. So part of my, my work was to look for missionaries to speak at our Friday night meetings. And so I said, uh, Mr. Dibler, if you ever come to St. Paul area, please try to save a Friday night so that you can speak to our, our college, to the young people there. And he said, I will do that. And so uh, we parted, and I knew nothing. I never even thought about the man again. I didn't know that he had been in Boone, in my home time, town, for a missionary conference, and several times came back and stayed in the home with my mother and my father. I did not know that he even had my father's permission to marry me if he could win me. But you know, God was in all of this. And uh, he went from Boone out to Nebraska, and there was my sister, the pastor's wife. And he saw my picture there, and he said, well, what's she doing out here? My sister said, that's my sister. 
So everything, I guess, that my folks hadn't told him and the people the church hadn't told him about me, my sister filled in. But I was in St. Paul, and they were having the 50th anniversary of the Alliance, Christian Missionary Alliance, the founding of it. And he was one of the missionaries who was speaking, came up with Dr. R. R. Brown. And he had been a dear friend to me. I'd learned to know him well through the youth rallies and going out there and uh, listening to him on the radio. So that day when they all came in, they, uh, my mother and daddy, because I worked for my room and board to be able to attend college. Otherwise, I couldn't have gone. And I was so thrilled to think that the Lord opened the door for me to live in a home with some people. I did all the work in that household, everything except the sheets and she sent those out to be washed. And this, uh, they were building a home, and she said to me, can you sew? And I said, sure, I can sew, because I've been making my own clothes since I was 12. She said, could you make drapes? I said, yes, I'm sure I can. And curtains? I said, yes. Could you cover some of the chairs? I'd never covered a chair in my life, but I said, yes, I can. I know I can. And I did her covering of her chairs and everything for her new home. And then all I, I got every week, one dollar in cash and my streetcar tokens to go back and forth to college and my room and my board. I was just thrilled. And I know there are a lot of young people who wouldn't do that today. They said, one said to me, that's slave labor. I didn't think so. But if it were, that's all right because I could be in Bible college to prepare to do what God had asked me to do, and that was to be a missionary. And then when uh, uh, it came the last two weeks of school there, my daddy and mother sent me enough money to stay in college. And I looked up, I had a feeling that somebody was watching me. And I was looking at others at the other tables, and, and uh, I didn't see anybody looking my direction. And I look up in the catty corner in the room was the table where the faculty sat. And there was this man, and he was smiling and nodding at me. And I thought, why is he doing that? He doesn't really know me. And then I, I looked back again, and there he was smiling and nodding again. And I thought, oh, somebody's going to see him. So when I got up at the end of the meal, I saw that the rest of the faculty had gone out, and he was still standing there. And I thought, oh, I'm going to go in, and I'll talk to my friend, the cook. He was a dear man of God. And uh, when I peeped through the serve server, I saw that he had left. So I went out the swinging doors, and somebody grabbed my arm and said, just a minute, Miss McIntosh. There's a gentleman here that would like to meet you. And there he was. And uh, I said, oh, yes, I remember meeting you in Boone, Iowa. And um, so he wanted to talk about, he'd just been to see my dad and mother, and I said, that's very nice. I did not feel in any other way except that I admired the man and his message, any feelings for him. And so he said, uh, I've just seen your father and mother, and I said, well, that was nice. He said, I met your sister out in Nebraska. I said, that was nice, because she's a dear woman. And um, he said, uh, by the way, uh, uh, would you know anybody from your hometown that might have written an anonymous letter to me? And I thought that he was insinuating that I had written an anonymous letter. And I said, Mr. Dibler, I want to say something to you. I have never written an anonymous letter to anybody, and I don't plan to in my lifetime. And I started to walk away. And uh, he came calling me, Miss McIntosh, Miss McIntosh. She said, I know you didn't. I just thought maybe you knew who would. I said, I'm sorry, I don't know. And I said, I have to get to class. And so I walked off. Well, that night at the meeting in Minneapolis at a big theater to hold the crowd, uh, I sang in the chorale, and I looked up, and here was this young man right there exactly opposite me. And he was smiling, nodding to me. And I thought, I don't know why that man does that. And then he said, um, uh, when he had finished speaking, he sat down. And at the end of the meeting, I looked over, 
and I saw that he was coming down the steps in my direction. So I just slipped out the side door, and I was walking along with those that came in the same bus as I came in. And um, as I was walking down, talking to the others, I felt someone tugging on my coat. And I turned around, and there he was, smiling at me, and he said, I want to take you to dinner tomorrow night. I said, no, that's not possible. I said, I uh, am catering for a birthday party, and I did this because I got an extra dollar, and I would cater and do all, all the cooking and serving and everything, doing the dishes later, and I got an extra dollar. And I said, no, I, I'm catering a birthday party. I couldn't do that. I said, I couldn't even be here before 5.30. And he just looked at me. He said, I'll see you at 5.30 at the front door and walked off. I thought, that's what you think. <laughs> and um, when we got in the bus, I saw that all the other girls were sitting there talking about that missionary. Oh, those beautiful long fingers. He must play the piano. And his curly hair. Oh, and one girl who had opened, everything had opened and shut, her father was very wealthy. She said, I'd give my right leg to go with that man. Well, it was sort of like playing one up on you. I don't know if you've ever done that. But I thought to myself, well, they would like to go with him, and they can't, and I can, and I don't really care whether I do or not. But the next afternoon, I was there at the door at 5.30. And he said, uh, where would you like to go to dinner? I said, well, doesn't make any difference to me. So we went to a Chinese restaurant, and in the middle of the meal, he put down his fork, and I just thought, something's coming, and I tried to think of something really trite to say, and I said, a penny for your thoughts. He said, do you really want to know what I'm thinking? Then I didn't know if I did or not. <laughs> he said, I love you, and someday I want to marry you. I laughed at him. I said, you don't even know me. He said, well, I know a lot more about you than you think. He said, one thing I know is that you want to be a missionary. I said, yes, I do. And I want to go where God wants me to go. So we went back to the um, theater, and we were a little late coming in, so sat in the back row. And. Um, I was uh, thinking about how I could just go quickly and quietly after the meeting was over, because um, I really had no feelings of, of affection for that man at that moment. But he said, look around. And so I turned, and, and I thought he wanted me to see somebody coming in the door. And he said, no, look this way. And I turned, and I looked up into his face, and in that moment, I would have gone anywhere with that man. But I said nothing because I hadn't checked it out with my Lord. He said, I'd like to see you tomorrow night, if possible. I went home and I prayed about it. And the Lord said, I've sent him to take you to the mission field. And the next night we missed because they called for a special meeting of those that were going on to the next town. But at 6.30 the next morning, there was a letter in which he asked me again to marry him. He said, I know you don't know me, but I'm coming out in the summer every chance I get. And he did. And I knew I loved him deeply and purely. And we were married. Um, he said, um, how old are you? I said, well, I'm 19. He said, 19? He said, they'll never accept you. He said, I'm 31. I said, sir, then if the board objects, you and I will both know this is not God's will for our life. But nobody asked me how old I was, and they knew how old I was because they'd gotten my credits and everything from the Bible College. And I passed with flying colors the examination before the board. And the president of the Alliance, Dr. Schumann, said, we already have the apartment set up for you in our home. We want you to stay with us. So I went back to New York to Nyack, the finishing school for missionaries. You had to have one year at Nyack. 
And when I uh, would be steadying, and I would hear them come in, because he was often, often meetings, Mr. Dr. Schumann and his wife. And my husband, of course, was away most of the time in missionary conferences. But I would go in and sit at the feet of that man of God. He was very much like Dr. A.W. Tozer. He was such a blessing to me. I learned much from those people of God. They would take me down to New York sometimes at the weekend, and I would wait there for my husband to come in on the train from someplace. And I loved going into their offices. They always had time for me, even though I was young. And we talked together about the Lord, and I was just absorbing everything from them because they were all retired missionaries who had given their life on the field. They knew God. And I would hear the phone ring, and somebody would be calling from one of the mission fields or another. And then they would uh, put the phone down, and they'd call everybody into the office. And those men went to their knees and prayed until God gave the answer for whatever should be done about the problems, or prayed through for the healing of some of the missionaries that were very ill. And I thought, isn't that a marvelous thing to know that when you go out to the field, you have men like that, men of God, who know him, who are praying for you. The field sent word and said they needed us immediately. So I only finished, not quite finished, but I almost came to the end of the first semester there, but they gave me all my credits. And on um, the 28th of January of the next year, 1938. We were on, the bo on board a ship on our way to the mission field. I never uh, thought much about it until the band started to play um, Harbor Lights. And as I stood at the rail, waving to those precious men that had come down from New York, I began to think about the harbors into which God might take my life. And God has taken me into many harbors, the harbors of excitement, of being with people who had never known God, people who were just come out of darkness and hearing for the first time the light of the world is Jesus. And he's taking me into harbors of suffering, sorrow, but the thing that's made the difference is that, as a little girl, I put him in the wheelhouse of my bark. And so he has guided me. And as was said by a man of God, I've thanked God for every storm that has shipwrecked me on the rock Christ Jesus. And there I stand. We went to Holland and studied the Dutch language and were there six months. And then the word came, come on to the field, we really need you. Dr. Jaffrey had felt that it was uh, possible that we were going to get permission to go into these newly discovered people in the heart of New Guinea. And of course, he wrote a letter to us, which crossed ours in the mail, asking if we could be considered as missionaries to go into these newly discovered people in the heart of uh, what was then called Dutch New Guinea, now Irianjaya. And his letter crossing ours in the mail asked if Russell would be willing to not go back to Borneo, but to pioneer the work in New Guinea. And we arrived in the Dutch East Indies now called Indonesia, on our first wedding anniversary. And it was a great excitement for me to meet these missionaries that I had been hearing about. And they, even though I was so young compared to most of them, they just took me in as though I had been known by them for years. I felt at home with them. And we got back to the house, the mission house, and they said, well, you're going to stay here for your time here. And um, there will be a teacher coming tomorrow morning to teach you. 
the Indonesian language. So I was up very early. I was so excited about learning this language, but because all the people were coming and greeting me, and I didn't know how to greet them, and uh, I just had to know that language. So I sat down at the desk in this little room, and I looked up, and here came, uh, he was rather elderly, gentleman in a white suit, an Indonesian from the island there, Manado. And he uh, looked at me, and he walked, as he walked in, and he put his hands together, and he said, Salama pagi, nyonya. And I thought, well, slam it or whatever that was. <laughs> That's interesting. He turned around and walked out the door again. And then he came back in, and he said, Salama pagi, nyonya. And the wheels began to go around. He's greeting me. I've got to remember that. Salama pagi, nyonya. And I was saying this to myself. When he came back in again, he bowed once more, and he said, Salama pagi, nyonya. And I said, Salama pagi, nyonya. He said, oh, bukan, 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 saya ini, bukan, nyonya, saya ini, tuan. And I thought, what did I do? <laughs> and then he pointed to himself, and he said, tuan, tuan. And he pointed to me, and he said, nyonya, nyonya. And then I realized that he had said, good morning, missus. And I said, good morning, missus. He said, no, 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 no. He said, uh, and so he walked out again, came back in, and he said, salama pagi, nyonya. And I said, salama pagi, tuan. He said, oh, bike, bike, bike. I didn't know what a bike had to do with it, <laughs> but I learned that word means good. It was very good. And so he started to teach me. And you know, within three months, I had a working knowledge of that language. And I started to teach in our Bible college there. It was a real joy to be able to use that language and go out to the villages and talk to people. And it's a very beautiful language. John 3.16 says, Karana demikian Allah. Mengasi isi dunia ini sehingga dikruniakannya. Anak yang tunggal itu. Supaya jangan binas. Supaya siapa yang percaya akan dia. It's a beautiful language. And then I began to uh, prepare for my husband's going because we could not get permission for women to go. And so he said, we will go. And there was another man who had been appointed to go too. And uh, so the both of them left for New Guinea. They had, uh, they had put down a a post there in the interior. Now, these people had just been discovered. There was a plane that was flying over the heart of the island, the second largest island in the world. And they saw below them these beautiful snow-capped mountains that runs like a, a, a spine down through the center of the island. And they're snow-capped the year round, called the eternal snows of the tropics beautiful glacier lakes. There's nothing in the Alps that even compares with them. And they flew over the northern escarpment of that range and dropped down from about 19,000 feet. And there they saw below them what appeared to be strange circular clouds in bowls of mountains. And as they came down lower and lower, they discovered that they were not cloud formations, but lakes in this part of the world that uh, had not been discovered really until this time when the plane went over. And then the thing that amazed them was on these lakes were men and women rowing canoes trying to get away from this. They said we thought it was a, a big bird from the spirit world because everything beyond the perimeter of your valley, the mountains, out there beyond is the spirit world. When they die, the spirit goes over into the spirit world. And they thought it was a big spirit. And they fled into the jungle. And for three days, they said, they stayed in there. And this big bird out of the spirit world didn't come back again. So then they came out. And then men came, the patrol officer with police. And they knew that there, this lake emptied into a river that flowed right down to the south coast. So if they followed that river, they would eventually come into this place where there were people that the world didn't know existed before. And they went into the interior, and they made it, and they found these pygmoid people. They are pygmoid and uh, belong to the Upper Paleolithic era. They had stone axes, stone adzes, never seen metal 
had never seen a wheel. And they were amazed at these people that came out of the spirit world. And then more police came. And then my husband had reached the south coast with permission to go in over the trail. The other missionary, uh, when the police patrol officer came down, he was brought down. He had died the first day on the trail of a heart attack. He didn't think he could make it. And so he went back with the boat when it left. And my husband, with some carriers from the uh, coastal area, went in. He had a very difficult trail uh, um, and a time on it where this will tell you what kind of a trail it was. In s just 18 days, he lost over 60 pounds. He was hardly able to walk when he got into the interior. And then a, an expedition came out under LaRue La from Holland. And they were there, and they had a plane that was available to them. They were saying that man would never walk to the coast again because he had gotten kutu ire. It's a fungus that gets on the feet and eats off the skin. And so they knew that he'd never walk it back to the coast. So they flew him out to the north coast to Manaquari. There he got shipping and then came back to the island of Makassar, Celebes. Makassar is the post port. And when I looked up and I saw this man, I couldn't believe it was my husband. He had lost so much weight. He just looked so different. And then I saw that he was being helped down the gangplank. And when he got back to the house and took off his shoes and socks, there was no skin from the ball of his foot covering the ball of his foot or any of his toes. He had gotten this kutu ire, and it just sloughs off. The flesh just sloughs off. And they called for a doctor to come, and when he saw his feet, he said, now you are going to have to take the tweezer, and every morning, you see this flesh sloughing off, take the tweezer and rip it off till you get down to the raw, throbbing flesh underneath. And then he said, apply the medicine. And morning after morning, that's what I did. And I kept as I saw the flesh begin to slough off, I'd rip it off and then apply the medicine. One morning, Dr. Ari Jaffrey, our field chairman, great man of God, who had been a missionary up in China for 30 years, had been through the Boxer Rebellion, had been in the hands of bandits. He knew what it was to suffer on trails in New Guinea, uh, in uh, China. And he looked at Russell's feet, and I just saw a wave of nausea go over his face, and he just backed out the door and shut the door quickly. He didn't come out for lunch, but in the afternoon he laid before me what became the uh, editorial in our field magazine, The Pioneer. And I looked down at it, and I read. He said that today I watched a young wife dressing her husband's feet, and they were bleeding and running with pus, and he said, all I could think was, what a nauseating sight that is. But as I backed out of the room, the Lord said, but to me, they are beautiful feet. And he said, I saw it all. How beautiful upon the mountains, those broken bottle limestone mountains, are the feet of the missionaries that bring a message of hope to men and women that have sat in darkness, who have never heard of him. And he said, I saw that someday, it would all be over. The tired, bleeding feet of missionaries would for the last time go over these broken bottle limestone mountains. And it is like walking over a broken bottle. We all had cat's claws on our boots because it's like stepping on a broken bottle. And um, he said someday one of those missionaries will for the last time walk down into one of these newly discovered valleys Someday, for the last time, they would tell the most wonderful message that there is, that Jesus died for sinful men. Someday, for the last time, someone is going to bow and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me and come into my heart and life. And then he said, the clouds will part asunder and Jesus will be there. You know, I've never crossed a mountain. I've never gone down into a new valley without thinking, is this Lord? the last valley. My husband, when he was able to walk, turned around, went back to New Guinea again, and this time accompanied by the other missionary because 
Some of those that my husband had won to Jesus Christ in Borneo had heard about the trouble that their Tuan was having over New Guinea and what terrible trails there were and about the rapids in the river before you get on the trail. And so they organized themselves as burden bearers of Jesus. And they said, we will come and we will help you. And so they arrived in Makassar. I have never heard such music in my life. There stood those men with their, with their G-strings and the little caps that they wear to hold their hair. And I listened to them singing the gospel hymns that they had put in their five-part harmony and singing the praises of God. I wished then that I had known about things that you could use for recording. I never heard such music. They were stor stories of the Bible and, th and other things that they had put into their own language and into their own music. And when they left, we all said goodbye to, to them. And everybody in that congregation stood up before them and said, we promise that while you're gone, we'll be here in this place praying for you. And they left and went over and they had worked on that trail and they had cut. They have the big machetes and they cut the forest away and the jungle and they repaired the trails and places where it would take you days to go around the mountains in order to get up onto the next level. They had uh, made uh, ladders and threw them up against the walls of the mountains. Other places they made bridges for us to cross streams. Sometimes it was a woven bamboo bridge that they stretched across a swinging bridge. Other times it was just a, one of these huge trees of the jungle that they cut down, let it fall across till it hit the other side. And that was your, your walk your bridge across. I said, I've never claimed one verse and so many times in my life as that verse, and none of his steps shall slide because anything that's dormant in the jungle even for a few days is slippery and it's covered with moss. He got back into the interior and I was still waiting. I was teaching in the Bible school, loving it, loving the people that I was teaching because I knew that these were our missionaries of the future. And one day I got a letter from him. He said, I was down in the village today with the old chieftain, Idan Togli. And he said, for the I don't know how many of the time I told him this story, he said, tell us, tell us again. And he said, as I sat there, I said, Idan Togli, why don't you accept it? Why don't you understand Jesus died for you as he died for us? The old man shook his head. He said, no, Tuan. He said, we've loved the story to think that this Jesus died for you spirit beings. But he said, we are people. He said, but we love the story. But if Jesus died for you, he didn't die for us because he said, we're born of women. And my husband said, so am I. I was born. I have a mother. He just shook his head. He said, that can't be. He said, and he said, you don't, need, none of you has a wife. None of you has children. If you're not spirits, how did you come into existence in the first place? He said, but I tell you again, I do have a wife in the outside. He said, we don't believe that. He said, if you'd had a wife, she'd have been on that trail. She'd have carried your carrying tins for you. You wouldn't have to have these other people come. He said, wherever we go, our wives go along. They carry the loads. I thought he had a good idea. He said, I tried to tell him that, yes, maybe my wife could come up the trail. But he said, the chieftain out there, how do you tell him about a governor? But the chieftain out there will not let her come. He said, well, if that chieftain of yours is, has such a bad stomach, that's the way of people not, disagree, not agreeing with you. If he has such a bad stomach, he said, why don't you get rid of him? Get somebody that will do what you ask. He said, then you maybe get somebody that will let your wife come, and she can carry your loads in. He said, of course. He said, if that woman of yours is that weak that she can't carry your supplies in, he said, I'll send young men, I'll send them down there to bring her in. And when I got that letter, I just, I knew in my heart I was going to get permission to go. 
And so I just ran in and I threw up the letter to Dr. Jeffrey. I said, I'm going to New Guinea. He said, I've known it for two weeks. The Lord had shown him that it was the time for us to go and apply. So the wife of the other gentleman and I went over to Ambon, which is your sort of jumping off place in the Spice Islands. From there you leave the big KPM and you go down to the south coast on a government steamer. And uh, he, uh, when we went in to see the governor, he said, uh, uh, oh yes, he said, uh, I understand you're wanting to go and join your husbands. He said, you have my permission. And then he told us that the people in the interior, thinking that we really were pu uh, spirit beings, but everybody protesting that they were human beings, they gotten together and said, um, let's try shooting one of them. If the arrow goes through them and they don't die, we'll know that they are spirit beings. But if they bleed and if they die, uh, we'll know that they're human beings like us. And so a group of them had um, surrounded the government party and they uh, immediately started to pull up the bow and arrow and in self-defense the police killed out of their party, the natives, seven of them. And that the condition was very bad then because they hadn't proved to themselves that these were spirit beings, but they had amazing instruments that they could use for killing them. And so the patrol officer said, either you send women in here, or you send us more police, or the th third alternative is we abandon this post, it's too dangerous. So he said, you have my permission to go. And he said, you'll have to go down and see the captain of the government white boat. It was a small steamer that went down to the south coast. And he said, if he is willing to take you, that's fine. And then he stood up and he put his hand across the desk and he said, I want you to know that every day you're on that trail, I'll be here at my desk praying. I love the Lord too. And that was a real seal to me of God being with us every step of the way. Well, it was the time of the West Monsoons. The captain was a bit difficult. He said he'd never taken a woman down there. I said, I know that, but that's the only way we can get into the interior. We have to get to this little village of Uta. He said, well, no women have ever gone down that, that way, that far. And I said, I know that, sir, but this is our only opportunity to go and with you because it's the time of the West non Monsoons. None of the Chinese vessels are going. None of the native prowls are going down there. He said, all right, if you're ready. He said, I'm sailing on such and such a date. And we were there at the crack of dawn waiting for him on the jetty. And so we took off. And I've never been sick, seasick as many times I've been around the world on vessels. But I tell you, I never came closer to it, not on that one. That was not only going over these tremendous waves like this, but at the same time, it was rolling. He said, uh, the captain said, well, we really couldn't stop now. You know the conditions of the sea. And he said, we can't take this larger vessel up into the mouth of the river because there's a big sandbar there. So we'll take you on down with us to, to the uh, next area. In Manaquari, he said, then in three months we make our return trip, and it's always calm at that time of the year. And we thought, three months on this vessel. And we went to prayer that night. We believe that the same one who said, peace be still to Galilee is alive, and he still has all the ancient power in his hand. And we said, Lord, you can calm the sea. When we arrived there the next day, I have never seen a glassier sea than that day. Just an hour it took us to be put into the lifeboats and all of our things loaded in with us. And we were rowed around the sandbar and then up into the mouth of the river. And our husbands had come down trail to meet us. It was a wonderful thing to be together again after the months and months that had separated us. That's a terrible place Uta is. Uh, we had to immediately start taking quinine because practically everybody there is affected by the mosquitoes and had malaria. But we got things together and we started up the river. We had two of the long boats that belonged to the coastals. And you couldn't paddle. 
you had to pole because there were rapids in the river. And so I had four men in the fore part of my canoe and four men in the aft part of the canoe. And I was sitting there in the middle and I'm always asking questions. And I always carry a pencil and a paper with me wherever I go. And I kept tapping this man in front of me and asking him what the name of these blossoms were, these trees, because the flame of the forest trees were in bloom and dropping their blossoms. It was absolutely beautiful. And I was looking at the shore, and there on the shore were these big crocodiles, their mouths wide open and little sandpipers picking their teeth. And I asked them what those were, and they told me. And uh, of course, I found out that there are dialectical differences. And so I uh, wrote down that they were buayas. And then I was uh, watching, and I said, uh, um, do they ever overturn the canoes? He looked down at me. I know he thought it was the greenest thing he'd ever had in his canoe. He said, oh, yes. He said, sometimes they do, but all you have to do is jump for the shore. Well, the next afternoon, and we slept on the shore that night, I thought, sure, a crocodile would come in <laughs> to my bed with me, but they didn't. And the next day, about four in the afternoon, all four of these men jumped out of the canoe, and they were struggling with something in the water, and they were their poles, and I saw something lashing about, and I thought, oh, it's a crocodile. And I looked at the shore, and it was so far away, and I thought, I wouldn't make that. So I sat down again, I'll sit here. And suddenly they came up with the biggest stingray I have ever seen in my life. And they said, this is the best meat that you will ever have eaten. They roasted it on the coals of the fire on the shore. They didn't offer me any, so I can't tell you what stingray tastes like, because I've never refused anything whatsoever that the people have ever given me. My husband looks at me and laughs at me. He said, those caterpillars, that must be like swallowing a toothbrush. I said, oh, no. No, I said, you just get a handful and put them on the coals of the fire and, and just a few rolls and all the hairs are burned off. And you, uh, I know, you're laughing, you think, ugh. But you pull them apart and there are just three little white threads in there. It's just that it takes so many of them to make a meal. But um, the, I don't know what stingray tastes like. We got to our base camp and uh, my husband said, Idan Tuagli, the chieftain, is sending down men to help carry supplies in. So I was excited. I was sure they'd soon be coming in. And all of a sudden, I heard a sound like this, coming out of the jungle at a distance. Oh, oh, oh I was excited. I thought, it's the Kapaukas. And he said, yes, it is. He said, they're coming. And I ran outside, and there were some fallen logs there where they cut trees down to make this uh, a lean-to. and. Um, I was watching for them, and suddenly I saw these little brown men coming. And I, they ran around and around, and I kept watching them. And I was so excited to see them. And uh, I, all of a sudden, they stopped their yodeling. And they said, where's the woman? And my husband pointed to me over there on this pile of logs. And they came up the better to see me. And so they kept going like this, and they said, are you the same color up there where we can't see you as where we can? I said, yes, I am, because I've been studying word lists from my husband. And uh, they, I could hear them saying, feels like flesh. There's a bone in there. Oh, yes. And so then they were excited. And they were talking all night long, it seemed like. And they were tying up their carrying tins. We let no one start on the trail with uh, any tin that was heavier than 60 pounds. That's all they could carry. But two-thirds of that load was their sweet potatoes for the trail. And so you arrived in the interior with about 20 pounds in each carrying tin at the cost of a dollar and 66 cents a pound above what it cost for. So we only took things that were absolutely necessary because people are important. Things are not. You know, I see these days, it's like someone said, we. We used to love people, and we used things. But these are days in which we use people, and we love things. And that's the difference. In those days, we really loved the people. And so we said to them on the trail, I, would, I have my word list, and I would say, and what is this? 
and they'd give me the answer. And I'd write that down. I would note who said it to whom and what time of day it was, because this all makes a difference in your language, the structure of it. About the fourth day on the trail, I loved it. And I uh, was always saying to my husband, you know, the worst thing about this is, because you had to go down in the river when you got to the end of the trail that day, and you took your bath in the river with your clothes on, washed out all the mud that had gathered on your legs and, and all over you, and took your bath with your clothes on. Then you took off leggings because we had to protect our legs from the leeches as much as we could. And um, then you took and took your boots off. And with iodine or a match, you went over your legs to get all the leeches off because if you pulled them off, and that would leave the head in there, and then you'd have a tropical ulcer in no time. And we'd go over our legs with iodine, because that stung, and they'd drop off. Or a match in the heat made them drop off. And then we would get in, and we would put on our only dry suit that we had, and we'd sleep on the, on the ground in the dirt there. Or if it were a dry day, then we would cut down some grass and put a little grass down in there. And um, they said, why does, your, why does that woman of yours always go, oh, ooh, like this every morning? He said, because it's cold in those wet clothes. They said, well, throw them over, and we'll heat them up for her on the coals of the fire. So I would throw my clothes out when I put my dry clothes on, and they would, the next morning, hold them over the coals of the fire until they were real warm and steaming, and I smelled like a... a uh, smoked herring the rest of the way into the interior. But, oh, that felt so good to put on that warm suit. And um, this one morning, about the fourth day on the trail, I had just pulled the pins out of my hair, and I had quite long hair before the war. We ended up with one comb for nine people. And livestock was plentiful, and we cut our hair off real short, and we looked awful. But that day, when I pulled the pins out of my hair and it rolled on over my shoulder, this one fell, and they were just getting so rude to me, and I thought, what did I do? I've done something that's offended them. And he was yelling, Ega, Niwe, quickly now, Mama, let's go. And he was hitting the door, and the door fell in. And there I stood, my hair hanging down over my shoulders. And he looked at me, he said, Oh, no, Kakagia, Akiyagamo, Makadi Akiyagamo, Yame Okai Io Kidani Beo. He said, Mother of mine, indeed you are a woman. No man ever had hair like that. And he came in, and he grabbed my hair, and he was yanking it. And then he yanked it on this side, and then he took up here at the top, and he yanked that, and it was still mine. And he went out there yelling at the top of his lungs, come look at it, come look at it. It is a woman. It's a woman. And my hair suddenly was going in all directions as the people were yanking it. I wondered why they did that. And then I found out, you know you can take a man out of the 20th century here in modern America, or out of the Stone Age. They're all the same. They're very vain, especially when it comes to the forehead traveling. Now, that's our word for getting bald in the native language. And when the forehead travels back to here, that's a very serious situation. So you go into the jungle, and you get yourself one of these big cocoons. You eat the caterpillars first, and then you stretch that cocoon down over your head to cover that forehead that has traveled. Past tense, finished. And then you put on that pure potter's clay. And into the potter's clay, you stick the plumes of the cassowary bird, which is like a, an ostrich. And you have an enormous head of hair. I said, was I ever glad that those people hadn't seen our hippies? Because that was the thing that they felt was a seal, that this was a woman coming in from the outside world. I know these people suddenly realized not only that I was a woman, but that this message that they'd love to hear was for them as well. And so when they wanted me to go faster, they didn't say, hurry up there. Can't you walk any faster or anything like that? They're great psychologists. They never studied it, but they know how to practice it. And they would say to one another loudly enough so that I could hear it. They said, would you look at that thing back there? No legs on it. And I would start to walk the faster, and that's exactly what they wanted me to do. And so I made it over those 14 mountain ranges, not in 18 
days as my husband had the first time, but it had been so improved that we made it in eight days. I'll never forget if I live to be a hundred, that day when I arrived at the top of the last range and looked down and they said, this is the village of Adupa and we're going into it and now you will see our people. And I looked down and I saw these little brown people coming out of the gardens, coming in from the forest, others that were mo coming out of their houses. And they were all running up the mountainside and they were all yodeling as I did before. Oh, oh, I was so excited and I, I just had to say something. I'm very vocal, I'm afraid. And so when I saw them yodeling and welcoming me and I just threw up my hands and I was waving them with tears running down my cheeks. I was saying, I'm home, I'm home. And for almost 50 years, I felt that was home to me among these people of the mountains of New Guinea. I got down and everybody came up around me and they were feeling me and they were talking about me and everybody gave me a gift and I've never had so many gifts in one day of my life as that day. Everybody gave me the same kind of a gift. It was a roasted sweet potato. I had them in my arms and finally I couldn't hold any more and so I just sank down onto the mountainside and s sat there and then they all just came in around me and they were watching me and, and um, one of the carriers tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Mama, that is our chieftain who was coming there, Kapaga Adupa, Kapala, the head of Adupa. And I looked at this little fellow coming up there and he had a big bunch of arrows and a bow in his hand. And he was puffing and he came up and he looked down at me. And then I saw he was looking up at my husband who had just came, come over the top of the mountain. And he looked at my shoes, and I had the same kind of shoes as he did. And he looked at the leggings on my legs, and he was wearing them. And he looked up here at my cocky shirt, and he had on a cocky shirt. I had on a jungle hat that I always wore, a coolie hat, and he had on a hat. And he said, Aki Yagamo Met, are you a woman or not? And I said, yes, I am. He turned down his lower lip when they say no, you should have turned down your lower lip and say, Bail. He said, You're not. I said, I am. And then one of the carriers, he tapped me on the shoulder. He said, Mama, let your hair down. So I immediately took my hat off, pulled the pins out of my hair, and when it rolled down over my shoulder, he just dropped his bow and arrows like that. And he said, Oh, no, kai kagliar. Akiyagomo, ma kiri akiyagomo. Yame o kai iu kidani beo. And then he began to pull it to see, make sure it really was mine. And then he reached into the fire, and, or into my, the potatoes. And he was looking for one, I realized, that was still warm from the coals of the fire. And he finally found one. Now they had never seen metal, so they had no knives. And you let your thumbnail grow to be about that long. It's the nicest little paring knife you ever saw. And he took that potato and he rolled it in his hands. It had never been washed, not on purpose anyway. And blew on it, and then he peeled the skin off and then he rubbed it some more blew on it some more and handed it to me like this he said yagamo notanai woman eat the potato and i took it from him and because i didn't know sufficient of the language to tell him what i wanted to say during that day i just said it in english and i said someday by the grace of almighty god i'm going to sit down and eat with you anew in my father's kingdom and I did. I saw the day when he passed from death to life in Jesus Christ. And that man went with us up the rivers into the villages, wherever there were people living. And along with us, he would tell them, this is true, I know, because he has come into my life. And he said, I know my sins are washed away. I'm no longer afraid of the darkness. I'm no longer afraid of evil spirits because I know him. I really thank God that he was good enough to allow me to ever be a missionary and to go to people like this who have never heard of Jesus Christ. And we were clear up this one day with our canoe and with our three workers and this chieftain and the boy that was there working with us. And we came around the bend of the river and we knew that this would be the last of the villages before you go into the next tribe. 
And when we came around the bend of the river, we heard this screech of a battle cry. And they were yelling, Iki we no, and everybody had their bow strung and the arrow was in it. And it was on us. And for a moment, my hair went up like that, the back of my head. And I said, Lord, and just like that, he answered me. He said, thou shalt not be afraid of the arrow that flieth by day. And the fear was gone. I knew that day not one arrow would fly in our direction. So we pulled right our canoe right up to the river's bank, and they stood there with their arrows trained on us. And this old chieftain stood up, and he was shaking. And I pulled him down because I, you, you don't want to show fear before them. They despise cowardice. That's one thing I learned about the people of interior New Guinea. And he said, but I want to tell them and he stood up again, and he said, put your bows down. These people have something to tell you. I'll tell you first. And they sat down, and he told them how he could come to know Jesus. And so each one in turn told him this beautiful story of the love of Almighty God for, for fallen man. And the old chieftain said, you know, I feel it here. But I really don't understand yet. He said, tell me just once more. And then someone else would tell him. And he said, look at this. This is mine. He said, I will build you a house. And he said, my women will dig the gardens for you. We'll raise the sweet potatoes for you. We'll go get your firewood for you. He said, we'll do anything if you'll just stay now and tell us more. And my husband said, we have to go down before dark because, he said, if we don't, we've already told him that in so many sleeps that we would be coming back. And he said, if we don't, they will send police up here. And he said, so we must go down, but we will come back again to you. We will come again and tell you more about our Jesus. And I'll never forget that man standing there with tears running down his cheeks. And he was holding out his hands and he said, Ki glenamano, Ki glenamano, just once more, once more. And before we rounded the bend of the river, my husband stopped and we called back the message of the love of God for us. And that was the last time I saw him. And we got down to our base camp and up into our little house. My husband had built a house for me. It was a lovely, our first home. Had bamboo mat walls on the sides and on the floor, and a tree bark roof. Uh, we had brought in isinglass, and so the window was made of isinglass, so we could see the beautiful lake out in front of the house. And it was air conditioned. The air came through just most any place. It was home. It was home to me. And that first morning when I had arrived and we had slept the night through and I had opened the door and going by the house was a little boy and he had coals in his hands, live coals. And I looked at him and he was shaking them up and down and he said as he went by, my mother's dead, my father's dead and I don't have anybody so I'm your boy. And he said, I'm going to build your fire for you. And he went out because I cooked over an open wood fire in a little hut at the back, and that little boy became my boy. He was a very precious little fellow. And wherever we went around the lake there, he was always with us. And then when we got back that night, they had come and said, um, word has come from Holland. They are in a stage of siege, state of siege by Germany. And we knew that the war was moving in on us. And uh, they said, um, we are going to have to close down this post because immediately they knew being drawn into the war because in five days, Holland fell. And so they said, we're going to have to close down all posts where there is nothing that is of value to the war and uh, it's going to come to the Dutch East Indies. So we were then in a state of war. And uh, we said, look, we could stay here. We're not afraid. The people have become friendly. Some of them have come to know Jesus. 
And they said, uh, he said, no, you can't. The government says you cannot stay without police and a patrol officer. And so we started to pack the few things to leave behind us. And that next morning when we started out having, I checked with that little boy the night before and I said to him, did you really understand that Jesus loves you and he died for you? And he said, oh yes, he said, I do understand. And he had prayed with me. And he said, I'm going with you now. And I said, no, Imopai, you can't come with me. I said, because you've had malaria once. I said, I've left the quinine with you. And I said, but if you get sick, there'll be nobody to help you. And I said, I, uh, you must stay here. He said, I'm coming down the trail around the first mountain, over the first mountain. And then I looked at this little fellow and I said, now you stay right here. Because I said, I'm going on and you have to go back. And I looked back and there stood that little fellow. Somebody had given him a straw hat and he had it on his head and in his gourd. And there he stood. And I saw that there were tears running down his cheeks and he was going like this and wiping it on his thigh because boys don't cry. And I waved, waved to him and he said, Mama, Eglakada, come back quickly. And I said, Imopai, as soon as I can, I will come home again, never realizing that it would be nine years and a war away before I saw that little fellow again. We went back to our headquarters, our um, s conference, field conference, then took place. And at that field conference, my husband was chosen as the assistant to Dr. Robert A. Jaffrey, our field chairman. And that meant then that we would not, when the war would be over and when there would be um, a conference coming on again, that we would still be there. He would have to remain there and I would have to remain there. And I walked out of the room when they said that he had been chosen unanimously. And I said, God, somebody's made a mistake. I said, that's my home over there. And uh, then Dr. Sneed, the field chairman, whom I had known in New York, he came out and then my husband came out and he was crying too. I said, there has to be some mistake, Dr. Sneed. He said, no, there's no mistake about it. He said, do you know that there was no other name on any ballot except those of yours and your husband's that did not have Reverend C. Russell Dibler on it. He said, you accept it from God. And I bowed my head and I said, all right, Lord, if this is your plan for my life, then I will be happy here with these people. And I love them. And everything that God allows into our lives is either for our good and it is also for his glory. God is not an evil God, like the gods that these people have been afraid of in their Eastern mysticism. God loves us, loved us enough to give his own son. And so we remained there. And finally, they opened up the post again. And we said goodbye to, the, to Mr. and Mrs. Post as they went back to New Guinea. And my heart went with them. And it was just two months after Pearl Harbor when we'd heard the news that Holland had fallen and that the war here in the Dutch East Indies brought us into the conflict. So the mother country had been gone and now the Dutch East Indies were drawn into the conflict. Everybody said they won't last very long because they were sending out from Britain some of the finest warships that they had, but they did not know how well prepared the Japanese were. We had had a barber in Makassar that had, uh, as far as we knew, known no English. Everybody went there for their, to get their hair cut, but that man knew English, had been there for almost 10 years, 
There were two men who had stores there. One was a bicycle shop, the other was a variety store. Those men, every Sunday, we used to see them go out with their beautiful big cameras. They were photographing every inch of that island. And they disappeared. All of these people disappeared. The pearl divers disappeared from the other islands. And they had all gone back to Japan. And they were prepared. They knew every inch of those islands. So they, ha uh, they, the big rock, as they called it there, Hong Kong, fell in three days. They said it could never be taken. It was. China fallen into the hands of them. There were not many that were still outside the war. Down into French into China, that fell. And then all of these other smaller countries like Thailand. And uh, they came into the back door down through the British Malaysia Peninsula into Singapore. Kamikaze pilots came in their planes, dived into those beautiful warships. Matter of hours, they were on the bottom of the straits. And we knew it would not be very long until they would be down where we were. So we immediately got booking for all of our students to get them back to their own islands and to their homes so that they would have food and not be caught in conflict as it came down. And then we, those we couldn't get booking for, we bought property so that they would be able to go out there and could grow their own food and would have a place to live until the conflict was over. Then we went up into the mountains. And uh, there were houses up there. Dr. Jeffrey had a house. Miss Kim, uh, Miss Marsh had a house. And uh, there was the big conference room and some other bedrooms attached to it. And so we went up there to get away from the shock troops because every report seemed to bring word of these shock troops and the things that they were doing, using their tor their their gun uh, their fire fighting equipment and burning people to death and all these things and we wanted to be away from these shock troops if we possibly could i'll never forget that last uh, broadcast that came from manila we still had our radio we were monitoring them and that man said everything's being bombed he said and it's coming closer to us and troops are moving in on us. And he said, we'll have to abandon this post here in the uh, big tower. And he, the last words he ever said was, come on, America. And you could hear the sob in his voice, and then it went dead. And that was the last we heard from them. We waited for them to come. They did not come into Makassar, where all the fortifications were, they knew where they were coming. There was a beach down there called Brombong, and they moved in and came across the beach without one shot being fired. But they had been using their guns then, these shock troops, and they were just killing people indiscriminately. Men that had been where there was the fire, uh, where there was um, the electricity plant out there outside of Makassar, put up their hands in sign of surrender, and they just killed them. And um, they hated for you to put your hands up like that because most people were taller than they were, and that annoyed them. And um, then they came into Makassar in and, and nothing flat. It was all in the hands of the Japanese. We were waiting for them to come, realizing that we didn't have many supplies, and so we were going to have to learn to eat things there. And we were trying out various grasses and trying to get a garden in as well so that we could have some source of food supplies, even after our rice and that we had stocked there, a stockpile of rice. We had some drums with kerosene in it for our lamps and uh, not much else beside that. And um, we knew that we were going to have to be able to live right there where we were with what was there available. Some of our believers from Makassar risked their lives 
to try to bring food to us. They'd come up over those mountains in the dark hours of the night, and they would bring vegetables and other things for us. One day, I was down on my knees in the garden when I heard somebody behind me, and I turned, and I saw a shoe on a foot there right beside me, and it was one of the shock troops, and they always wore, because they were on, they were with the Navy, they had to climb the ropes on the ships, and so their tennis shoes had a, the great toe was separated from the other four toes so that they could grip the ropes in climbing them uh, up on the ships. And I saw that, and I heard this, this fellow yelled at me. He said, go, piggy. And I jumped up, and he had the bayonet on his gun, and I peed. I went, and I was ushered over to the other house, and by this time, the other missionaries had been collected there. I saw Mr. Presswood. He had been beaten by the, there with the swords, and, and uh, he kept putting up his hands, and they'd beat him some more, and finally he just dropped his hands. He realized that they didn't want him to have his hands up in a surrender, a uh, position of surrender. And when we got in there, he, uh, my husband was standing next to me, and they uh, all were seated, the officers, and uh, they looked at us all and began to ask us what country we came from, and uh, most of them were from America. And uh, Ernie Presswood was from Canada, and Dr. Jaffrey was from C C Canada. He, he couldn't say it. He was so nervous, like the rest of us were. And the man said, where is C C Canada? Canada? And uh, he didn't know where it was. And so that meant that he wasn't going to suffer with the rest of us. Mrs. Presswood was under her husband's passport. He was Canadian. So the, he, they went out and they told us, uh, they said, well, you stay here. If anybody has ever seen outside of the premises here, we'll shoot you immediately. We won't ask questions. And uh, you are now prisoners of the Imperial Japanese Army. They said, we have just about defeated the Navy. We have sunk almost all of your ships. And through the years, that kept coming back and back to us. We've sunk all your ships again. Finally, I turned to someone and I said, do you know something about those clever Americans? They are building ships out of cork now because that Navy has bobbed up to be shot down again. But um, they went out that day and they said, uh, remember, no one leaves this property. And so we had spent much time in prayer, seeking the Lord about what we should do, because we knew that we were to stay there just before they came to get us and to make us prisoners there in our own homes. One of the Dutchmen came and said, we have a ship down at anchor on the south coast, and there is a road where you can get down there. We want to take all foreigners, all women and children that we can. And Dr. Jaffrey, a wise man that he was, said, don't talk about it to one another. You go to your knees, every one of you. And he said, you say, God, what do you want me to do? Do I go or do I stay? When we came together on that Friday when they were going to pick us up, this man um, said, well, this is the last possibility of your getting out. And we stood up and not one of us felt that we should leave. Dr. Jaffrey said then, he said, you will know now that this is where God wants you to be, and you can trust him. He said, if you had gone, he said, and the Lord had told you to go, you wouldn't have felt like a coward. But God's asked all of us to stay here. We heard through the grapevine that that ship was torpedoed three days out, and as far as we know, there were no survivors. So I knew I was where God wanted me to be, and he had spared my life. And he wanted me to be right there. It's two weeks after they came, the first time they came back, and it was Friday the 13th of March, and I have a bit of Irish in me, but I'm not at all superstitious, because I really believe that all things work together for good to those that love the Lord. And 
When they came back, the first thing they did is jump out of the truck and say, get some clothes for them. And so I ran inside, and they said, no suitcases. So I grabbed up the pillowcase off the bed, <clears throat> and I um, put in his Bible, a notebook, and his pen first, and then I filled it with everything I could get of his, and um, ran outside, and they were, had been talking to Dr. Jaffrey, and the man said to me, wait a minute, he said, what's wrong with that old man in there? And I said, well, he's had, um, he was in a coma just before you came because he has diabetes. I said, he has Bright's disease, which is a kidney problem. And I said, uh, he has heart disease. And I said, he also has the beginning of Parkinson's disease. And the fellow said, oh, go tell him. He doesn't have to go. If he's sick like that and needs all that medicine, he said, he won't live very long anyway. And he laughed. So I ran, and they were just starting the truck. And uh, they were starting to move down the road. So I grabbed the tailgate of the truck, and I reached up and gave this to Russell. And I said, uh, uh, goodbye, Russell. And uh, he reached down, and he put his hand over mine on the tailgate. And he said, I want you to remember one thing, dear. God said he would never, never leave us nor forsake us. And he was gone. And I followed him and the truck with my eyes as far as I could see them. And then they disappeared out of sight. And I came back, and I really felt just brokenhearted because knowing them as we'd come to know them, I did not know when or where we would see one another again. <clears throat> when I went in to see Dr. Jaffrey, I said, Dr. Jaffrey, why did they say all this medicine that you were packing? Because there's nothing that you have except uh, you watch your diet because you're diabetic. But I said, that's just you avoid all sugar, which we don't have much of anyway. He said, uh, medicine? Oh, he said, I have a little satchel that belonged to my father. And his father was owner of the Globe and Mail, the biggest one of the biggest newspapers in, in Canada. And he said, he gave me this satchel. And he said, because I had uh, Otoclone, and he loved eau de cologne to put on his handkerchief because he always perspired so profusely. And then he would wipe his face and his hands with it. And <clears throat> we never forgot his birthday because his birthday was the 16th of December. So the 16th of January, he would come out and he would announce, well, just 11 more months till my birthday. And the 16th of February was only 10 more months till his birthday. And he would go through the year like this. So none of us ever forgot Dr. Jaffrey's birthday and because we knew that he appreciated eau de cologne because it was very refreshing. We always seemed to give him eau de cologne. And all this medicine that this man thought he was packing was eau de cologne to take. He said, I figured that we would be going from here down to the coast. So he said, I took my eau de cologne. I was going to take my eau de cologne. And I thought, isn't that lovely how God fooled that Japanese officer to thinking that was medicine, because he didn't ask Dr. Jaffrey. He just saw him packing all this and uh, figured that if he were going to a prison, he wouldn't worry about eau de cologne. He couldn't have imagined anyone worrying about eau de cologne. And God knew we needed that man there with us. He was a dear man of God, and it was a precious time. We spent much of our days in prayer. We had to really preserve all the food we had, and we're very careful with it. Uh, some of our, one woman that I had led to the Lord before the war, she came down one day, and, and she brought me a half of a coconut shell, and in it, it looked like uh, cheese tidbits, those little cheese tidbits that they have. And I looked at it, and I thought, oh, lovely, where did she get that? And it was uh, something that was fried in coconut oil, and I tasted it, and then all of a sudden, when I put it in my mouth, it went through my, those children were looking for flying ants and had been catching them all day on the mountainside. That's what it is. I said, I gave the first one back to another, Mother Nature, and then I took another one. It wasn't half bad. So then I was glad to eat the rest of them. But um, we had some of our people, as I said, who came over those mountains in the dark hours of the night and brought to us food so that we wouldn't starve to death. 
And um, one time when they came, Dr. Jaffrey had uh, had his coffee that morning, and uh, no, it was tea, and he had put in three big t heaping teaspoons of sugar. And Margaret said, his daughter, he said, why, Daddy, are you doing that? You shouldn't take this sugar because you remember you have been in a coma. He said, Muggy, I'm healed. I know it. He said, um, I, I need this. And she just begged him not to take it. He said, I'm healed. I really am. And when this boy came in, I said to him, would you take a urine specimen from Dr. Jaffrey up to the doctor that is way up where the uh, Dutch women and children are? I knew there was a doctor with them. And he said, all right. He said, give me back some of my vegetables, and I will take them as though I were going up there to sell these vegetables to them. And he did, and he got the doctor to analyze it. And when the report came back, there wasn't a trace of sugar in his urine. He was completely healed. And for the rest of the time, it never came back. And um, I saw God work in such wonderful ways. And I said to him, how is it that they didn't take your watch or your flashlight? He said, well, they were taking everything else that they saw was loose. But he said, I had put that in under my pillow. And I said, Lord, this doesn't mean anything to them. But this was my father's. And he said, and I need this flashlight at night. He said, I pulled the pillow down over it. They never even touched the pillow or the bed. And uh, time and time again, when they would come and just go through the house and go through everything you had and steal anything that they just felt like they wanted to have, they never once picked up the pillow and looked. And there it was. He knew it would be. So. I can remember him just walking over there after they'd left and gone down the road, and, and he would pick up the pillow and put his watch back where it usually was on the side stand there. And that, that flashlight with those batteries, because we had no other batteries, lasted for two solid years. And um, that's God. Well, we had to really work on the garden. and. I'll skip a lot of that because uh, you know what it is to be short of food, probably. And so we learned to eat a lot of the grasses and seeds and things. One day they came and they said, you are just living in such luxury. Well, you know, that's ridiculous because it was a house that had uh, just um, a clapboard house but no lining to it at all. And so the rats could come in any place they wanted to come in. They could come in. And I said it was so disgusting to think that these city dwellers that were in the house with us had to go out when the rains start and invite all the country cousins to come in. And every night, um, Miss Jaffrey and I would go through the house, and we would look under the beds behind the uh, wardrobes because anything you left out would be have been chewed on in the morning. They would eat anything that was uh, uh, there, not put away. And so we would go through the house and run them out from under the bed and, and uh, make sure that we got them out of this room, and then we'd slam that door shut. And we'd go into the next bedroom, and into this bedroom over here. And then we would run them all down the hall, get them into the kitchen, because it was the only door in the house where you could shut the door and shut off their exit. They couldn't get out. And Margaret and, and uh, I, armed with brooms, would just fight those rats. And they'd run up the hall, and they'd jump on you and scree is squealing like they do. And we would fight those rats until we killed everyone that we had corralled. And then we'd carry out the bodies. Well, we had to do this every night, because what food we had was in short supply. And this one night, it was probably about 12 o'clock, I awakened suddenly, conscious of noises all through the house. And I listened for a moment, and I thought, yeah, I hear them there, I hear them I in here. And I thought, oh, where the rats. 
We're going to have to get up and go after him again. So I shook Margaret's bed, and I said, Margaret, we've got to get up and light the lamps and go out and have another go at the rats. I said, they're just absolutely everywhere. Well, when I got up, I went to the door. And uh, when I opened it, and we had a little tiny, tiny oil lamp that we kept there for Dr. Jaffrey in the night, if he had to get up. And someone just swished past me in the dim light of that little oil lamp. And I looked around, and I thought, it's Dr. Jaffrey. Why is he acting like that in the middle of the night? But when I came out and really looked at the person, it was one of these boogie bandits. Now, they were the known pirates of the islands because of their sleek canoes and uh, feared by other people, always wore a black sarong. And when I looked at this man, and here it was, one of these boogie spenders, and he just threw his black sarong up over his shoulder and pulled out the big machete, and there he stood. And why I did what I did, I don't know. I'm quite a coward. Anyway, I just started down the hall after that fellow, and when he saw me coming after him, I think he must have thought, what's that crazy woman going to do? I didn't have a thing in my hands. He just turned and ran. He ran through the bathroom and across the porch and down over the mountainside, and here's this crazy missionary running after him, and all of a sudden I stopped when I saw others coming out of the jungle. And I just stopped dead, and I said, Lord, what a stupid thing for me to do. And just like that, he answered me. He said, The angel of the Lord and recampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth. I was so shaken, I went back to the house, tried to pull the door shut, but the doorknob, the lock, the key, everything had been carved out, as they're very good at carving with their big machetes. And I, by this time, Dr. Jaffrey was awake, and he said, well, what's happened? I said, we've had bandits in here. And I said, look what they've done to the door. Can't shut it, so I'll go up and find a board, and I'm going to nail the door shut came back, went through the house. They had just taken everything, like the uh, curtains and, and anything that was food that happened to be in the kitchen, and um, anything that, that they thought they could use, it was gone. Well, after the war, I, I had been through the, this time been thinking about that person. I didn't recognize him. But it was somebody that must have known the layout of that house. And I thought about the gardener. Right, the gardener was a boogie's man. That was Dr. Jaffrey's gardener. And so I said to my second husband, I said, I want to go down and I want to find a man uh, that's right near where the Jaffreys lived and where I was during the war. Went down and I went through the villages and finally found him. And when he came, and I said, Nomo, were you one of those that came to the house during the time of the big fight? And I said, you came back night after night, and we heard you. We heard your dogs out there, and yet you never came in the house. I said, we had no way to protect ourselves. You could have come in and done whatever you wanted and taken whatever you wanted. And he just raised his head and looked at me in amazement. He said, Yes, we came back. But every time we came back, you always had these people standing in white, standing guard around your house. And you know who they were. They were the angels of the Lord. I never saw them, but I didn't need to see them because I believed his word to me. But they needed to see them. And so I sat down with him and explained who they were. They are Muslims. And he needed to hear more. But God answered my cry. What a stupid thing for me to be running down there after those men. And yet God said, the angels are round about you. Well, they took us from that home, and they took us on up farther into, about five kilometers farther into the interior, and then across a valley, and then into a little shacks that were over there. And um, it was worse than anything we'd ever lived in. And they weren't even as nice as the native homes. And they were, we were put there for almost a year. I really blocked out a lot about that because it was a difficult time. We never had, uh, from the time we left over there at our station in the mountains, 
We never had any letters from our husbands, knew nothing about where they were. And um, we finally found a bush that had little seeds on it. And so we would go and we would uh, tap the branches to get the seeds in our cooking pot. And this is what we ate while we were there. And um, we had a wonderful quality to it because the more water you would add, the more it would swell. So our stomachs were always full. I think it was a wild millet because it looks very much like millet seed. And um, Mrs. Presswood, who was the other married woman, and I used to stand out there in the rain outside just cooking that, and singing, and I suppose the one song that we sang the most was, he makes the rose the object of his love, and he guides the eagle through the pathless air, and surely he remembers me, my heavenly Father watches over me. Eventually this period in the mountains came to an end. We were ordered back to where the Dutch camp was. We slept in the church that night. And early, early in the morning, then the trucks came. And we were put in these trucks and driven to the coast. I said, that man drove like an idiot. I, if he'd ever been over here in the Indianapolis 500, he'd have won the race. But those of us who were young, I grabbed the, the cab and held on, and then I put my arm out. And the younger ones of us made a cordon right around the older people to keep them from falling off, because I think that was part of the reason he drove so crazily as he did, to throw us over the mountainside. Nobody would have, su have survived that. When we came near Macassar, and pulled into this one area, I looked at the buildings, the stone buildings that were standing there, and I recognized it as the native tuberculosis sanitarium. And they had um, uh, built these great long barracks, like, that were made of bamboo mat walls, mud floors, double-decker racks on which we slept, and a grass roof. And then we were told that all the foreigners had to leave any barracks they were in and get together in barracks eight. Well, that night, as we got together, we were given a large sheet of paper, and we were also told what kind of work we had to do. We became the workforce for the Japanese army. And so I, we were discussing it, and they said, will you choose somebody from your group here to be the leader of your barracks. And I think that, because I was one of the youngest uh, of the adults, and I think it was my facility in the languages because I spoke Dutch and I spoke Indonesian. And we had some Indonesian women there that had been married to Dutch. And also, I spoke English. So with those three languages, I could communicate with everybody. And the first night, I said, if we ever needed God, we need him right now. I said, we're facing a more difficult period than we've had up to now. I said, we are going to be the workforce for these Japanese. And so I took out the word in these languages and read to them, and we had prayer together. And you know, when others were breaking up and having quarrels and moving from here to there, not one person ever left our barracks except a, a, a Jewish woman and she wanted to get over with some friends of hers. And eventually, they, she was allowed to do that. And we had a Russian woman there. And she couldn't stand the word. She said, I have bad dreams when I hear about it. But she had left her husband and was out with someone else there, just going around the Dutch East Indies and got caught in the war. And um, so she moved out and moved to another barracks. But apart from that, everybody stayed there. And any time people died, there were Dutch people, Dutch people asking if they could come into the barracks. So our barracks was full. It was the largest barrack in the camp. And um, so we began to divide out the work and separate it to see who was strong, who could work down with the pigs. That was hard work. Those pigs had a beautiful cement floor in their pig pen. And they had everything, had to be kept spotless for these pigs, 
They had to even be washed. Buckets and buckets of water had to be carried for them. And they had to have three hot meals a day. So the camp commander would go out into the villages and he would shoot dogs and bring them in. And uh, if anyone was sick, then I substituted for them wherever they were. We, we would skin the dogs and uh, cut up the meat and um, cook it with the stems of the banana plants so they could have three hot meals a day. Garbage came in. Give it the finger test. There were things floating there that were big enough to eat. And so they had hot meals. And those girls that worked down there were really worked hard to keep everything spotless. And these then were going to be butchered and taken out for the Japanese army that was on the coast. We also had to build roads for them, worked on the coolie gang. You, when the trucks came in, you walked up to the back of them and, and uh, you rolled your shoulders over like I'd seen the coolies do down on the wharf. And then they would throw these bags onto your back and you grabbed the ears of the bag and you walked away with them for else or else. I had um, damage done to my four lower vertebrae. And I wore a brace for a long time after the war when I came home. It was hard work. And one of the problems was that because of those pigs out there, then we were getting more and more flies. And the flies carried the dysentery from one place to another. They were on your food all the time. And you were off forever brushing away the flies. And um, we cooked the porridge. If you cooked porridge, you were up at 4 o'clock in the morning to start the fires and cook it. These great big paddles, those were these 35-gallon drums. And um, if it had been used for kerosene, you didn't have time to let it uh, cook out so that the taste was gone. But one morning, oh, the porridge was so good. Couldn't believe it. Well, I said, well, it's just like, it's like chicken and rice soup. And uh, everybody was saying, I don't know what they did with it, but this is the best porridge we've ever had. Well, when it got light enough for it to see, a rat tail surfaced. And then there were feathers and the carcass of the bird and the carcass of the rat there. And some of them immediately left there and returned it to Mother Nature. And I said, I've got it here. I'm going to hang on to it. But uh, we never again, again had rice porridge with uh, the beautiful taste of rat and bird. But um, it was hard work. And people getting dysentery, more and more of them were down. And we, they finally made a barracks outside of the, the barbed wire so that we could have them somewhat separated because he was afraid that they were infecting everybody else. And it wasn't the flies and it wasn't his pigs that were bringing all the problem to us. But we, when they were in the last stages, uh, we used to set guards around them to keep the rats off because they smelled rat, the death. And rats would even be found with a child's finger in its mouth sucking the blood or their toes if it had gotten up against the mosquito net. I hate rats. I said, someday I'm going to write a book on the rat and I. But got into the volume valley, and here we have rats that weigh 30 pounds. But uh, it was a difficult time for us, and, and uh, we were substituting. Often I did three different jobs during a day in order to fill up the quota of work for people that were sick. And this one day I heard Mrs. Uh, Yaustra they're calling for me, and I went out, and she said, my Frau Dibra, I'd like to talk to you. And um, so I said, uh, oh, yes, I said, about the work. I said, I understand. I said, I have three other very strong young women in my camp. And I said, we're picking up the work for people that can't report for work. And I said, um, it is difficult, and it's getting more difficult. And then she stopped and she said, but I didn't really come to talk to you about the work. She said, I came to tell you that word has come. Your husband has been very ill up in the camp in Pari Pari. And I looked at her and when I saw tears, I grabbed her shoulders. I said, Mrs. Yostra, you don't mean he's gone. She said, yes, he died some three months ago. 
up in the camp in Pari Pari. I turned away from her and I turned to the only one I knew. And I just looked up and I said, God. And immediately he answered me. He said, my child, did I not say to you, when thou passest through the waters, and these are the waters of sorrow, when thou passest through the waters, I would be with you. And I'm here. And he said, through the floods, they will not overflow you and neither will a fire kindle upon you. And I said, all right, Lord. I said, just help me to restrain my tears because I said, there's so much sorrow in this camp now. I thanked her and I walked away and I leaned my head against the little ladder that led up to my rack where I slept. I said, God, I've never been through this experience before. I don't really know how to handle it. Then I heard the dead, the, the living people around me. And so I turned and I said, yes, they need my help. One woman was so sick, she called out. She said, my Frau Daibler, I'm sick. I've got to have a basin or something. I grabbed up a basin and I ran to her and held her while she vomited. I could hear little things plinking in the bottom of the basin. And I looked down into it, and it was worms, round worms. She was so full of round worms had gotten up into her stomach. We had worms of every kind you can imagine, and nobody escaped it. And uh, our children were full of worms, and all we had to give them was some of these little tiny red-hot onions that somebody had in the camp, and we planted them immediately. And we would give them as many as they could uh, eat because they're very hot. It was very hard with the little children. But to try to get that down, and then we didn't give them anything to eat until after they had had a movement. And that would be just filled with worms of every kind. And um, even out where we had the, the uh, toilets, you couldn't even get near the, the hole because of the maggots that were crawling all around it. So we'd have to grab, get water and wash them out. It was, a, it was a difficult time. So that afternoon after we had finished work, the camp commander called me over to his office. And I uh, went in and he was standing there behind his desk. And he said, Anyonya, he said, you've been such a help to the others. He said, don't lose your smile. And uh, I looked at him and I said, sir, may I speak to you? He said, yes. He said, you know, the women in Japan have heard just what you heard today. I said, I understand that, sir. I said, uh, and he said, you're very young. He said, someday the war will be over and you can go back to America and you can go dancing, go to the theaters, you can marry again and forget these awful days. And I said, sir, I do want to speak to you. So he motioned for me to sit down across the desk from him. And I said, Mr. Yamaji, I'd like to explain something to you about the one that I came to know as a little girl. And God gave me the most beautiful opportunity. I just laid the plan of salvation before him. Maybe you have never even heard about Jesus. I said, he was the son of the creator who made all things. And as I explained it to him, and told him, Mr. Yamaji, maybe God brought me to this time and this place for you. I said, maybe he brought me here to tell you he loves you. And I said, Mr. Yamaji, I don't hate your people. For where the love of God is, there's no room for hatred. And I said, and that is my hope. I know that someday that I'm going to see my husband because I know the Lord. And as I was speaking to him, the tears started down over his cheeks. And he just got up and he walked into his bedroom. And I could hear him crying in there and blowing his nose. He didn't come out to dismiss me because you never spoke to them without asking permission. Or they slap you right across your mouth. And you never left their presence without asking first to be dismissed. And then he would dismiss you. And. Uh, but it was so long, he didn't come back out, and I could hear him still in the bedroom crying. 
So I finally got up and quietly went out and left him. And, um, you know, things, as far as our food was concerned, they, we finally got some fish in. And they would bring in these little tiny fish. Well, we didn't take a thing off of them. We didn't take a thing out of them either. And um, I remember sitting one day next to Mrs. Presswood, and she was looking down at that fish, and I said, is there a problem, Ruth? I could eat that head, she said, if it didn't look up at me so pitifully. And I laughed. I said, well, I've already lost my pity for that little piece of fish. So I said, here's a piece of the tail of mine, and I'll eat the head of yours. Because there isn't a thing about a fish you can't eat. And um, the only thing is the pupil of the eye, because it gets like a little BB after it's cooked. It's very, very hard. So then we had settled into the work, and, and it was getting worse and worse. And um, one day, this big limousine came in. Now, we called it the death wagon, because it very often meant death for somebody in that camp. And it, was, it belonged to the Kempe Thai, which was like the German Gestapo. It was a secret police. And they would take people away, women that were taken away and came back, never talked about what happened to them. Some did not return. One day they called for Miss Kemp and Miss Seeley. And I saw little, we called him Sweet Seventeen. He had come into the camp. And he was the second in command because the other second in command was a very ruthless man. And I think that he even got on Mr. Yamaji's nerves. But he was a ruthless, cruel person. And so this little fellow, when he came in, he was just exactly the opposite. And he would always come over and want to shake hands. And especially every day he'd find me somewhere and he would shake hands with me. But when they finally told me that my husband was dead, he came over and he said, um, Nyonya, I am so sorry. And then I realized that that little fellow knew he had been in the camp with my husband when he had passed away. And he knew about it, and he knew that the Kemp Thai said nobody was to tell me anything about his death. And even the Catholic priest didn't dare to tell me when he came down to the camp, because they said, if you do, we'll shoot you. You have no right to tell her. And they expected, I guess, for me to commit harakiri, to kill myself. But um, this little fellow came running, and he was trying to find Miss Kemp Miss Seeley. Well, Miss Kemp was in the sewing room because we were making the uniforms for the Japanese. And Miss Seeley was down working in the garden. We raised the vegetables for the Japanese army. And when they brought them back, they didn't even give them a chance to come and get another P address or anything else. They just put them into the big black limousine and took them away. And um, I'd been working on the road, and I'm telling you, we were just shocked to see these two older women, godly women, my fellow missionaries, being taken away. And we pondered on why they would take them. And we remembered them in prayer every night when we gathered together and asked God to bring them back because we knew they were innocent of anything that would mean that they'd have to be taken to the Kempe Thai headquarters. And one day I realized the only other American in this camp is one that's been brought, was brought later in from the island of Ambon when it was bombed. And they were in another section of the camp. They had a, a different camp than ours. And I thought, I'm the only other American here. And uh, when I saw this one, big black limousine coming in one day. I was on the road, and I looked at it, and the whisper just went around, Kempe Thai, Kempe Thai. And I stood there watching them. And then I hoped that the doors would open, Miss Kemp and Miss Seeley would be released. But when they didn't, get out of the car, and nothing but officers and soldiers, and they went up into the headquarters, I knew in my heart they'd come for me.